Okay, yeah. So what I got out of that, uh, there'll be some sharing in a minute. We just read um, uh, the first part of the story of Calix, Catholic Spirituality for Addicted Persons. Uh, we read the foreword and the original credo and then the introduction. Um, I just, it talked about um, the year of the Holy Eucharist, announced the year of Eucharistic Adoration in 2004. And that took me back to when I was a catechist uh, because I've got a card upstairs it's a picture of Jesus, like at the Last Supper. It was a card to give children when I was a catechist. And so it must have been around that same time that I was a catechist, which would make sense. Um, and that's told me that um, that Eucharistic adoration will help in the development of this unit. So I think that's something for the future. But now it's time for sharing if people would like to make a comment about that. Uh, what we've read. I'll just leave the floor open. Uh, yeah. I uh, just want to mention about that. Um, he wished to win that big Powerball lottery. He was thinking that that would clinch the presence of the Blessed Sacrament in his chapel. But even if he won that amount of money, maybe Calix wouldn't have taken off because it's it's irrelevant. Having that amount of money probably would have gone to his head. Um, we should have, we always have enough to get by on, but having that enormous amount of money wouldn't, wouldn't have done anybody any good. And what was he going to do? He was going to give it to um, this, Arch, this Cardinal uh, Regali so he would look favorably upon his request to have the Blessed Sacrament in his chapel. But there was no need for that. Um, it's, it's muddy and spirituality is like oil and water. It, it helps, but it, they don't mix. Um, and as they say in AA, you got to give it away to keep it. Um, yeah, that's about all I can <laughs> contribute to that. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I'm Tim. I'm also a child of God and a member of Calix. Um, I liked um, part of the original credo, Calix credo, and um, uh, the idea that it's geared to our growth towards spiritual maturity um, and also that we welcome other alcoholics who are not members of our faith and any others, non-alcoholics, who are concerned with the illness of alcoholism and wish to join with us in prayer for our stated purposes. And um, uh, the, the story of, the, of Father Mackay um, growing up and um, getting introduced to uh, Bucky the, the wino and um, seeing him in a way as um, uh, a, a, a starving, shivering, suffering Jesus um, who, uh, you know, we're told, you know, with with God and um, and Jesus that, um, and even in the Bible, that, you know, some people, if we entertain them, they could even be angels in disguise, and um, and we're all basically, um, you know, children of God, and so He was able to see from a young age the um, the love of another person, and hearing the different, um, you know, pleas that he made uh, to his eminence about, um, you know, getting the the Eucharist um, for the people uh, who were being addicted. You know, he talks about how he bless, you know, bodies of young people from overdosing deaths um, with their parents crying over their departed children. And then he also blesses bodies of overdosing parents with their children crying after their departed mothers and fathers. Um, that just sort of goes to show that, you know, this illness or this disease, um, you know, cuts across all or a lot of range of um, uh, lives and, and ages and affects people of, um, you know, the from the young people in the family who are affected by the by the parents in addiction and also the, the parents 
um, at times with their children who are in addiction. Um, you know, I too at one point affected my family, uh, my parents in particular, by my addictions and um, caused them a lot of grief. And I had to, um, you know, try and make a bit of an amends and a living amends by staying uh, clean and sober for them. But um, I'm going to be interested, you know, I, uh, hearing of that um, with the Powerball, um, hoping for him to hoping to win. I've been led down that path um, over the last year of being introduced to the American lotteries and um, hoping to win over a billion dollars, <laughs> this type of thing, um, and wasting money, good money on um, on lottery tickets and realising that if I hand it over to God instead, um, I can put that money to good use elsewhere. And so that's what I've, I've finally done. And I've unsubscribed from all the emails I get through saying, you know, whatever it's up to, you know, over a billion dollars. So, yeah, um, I'm a work in progress, spiritual progress, not perfection. So uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks, Tim. Good to hear, good to hear you, mate. Uh, I'm Terry. I'm an alcoholic and a member of Calix. Um, hey, Terry. Sorry. Okay. Um, I enjoyed um, the uh, uh, the readings tonight uh, as a, like a, a prelude or a a, uh, a taste of what might come as we read through the history of Calix. Um, and um, yeah, I'm always struck by the, you know, the very, you know, what's the word, uh, like overt Americanisms. But anyway, uh, that um, that Australians don't always relate well to. Um, and it remind you what it took me back to a um, a situation of my own when. Uh, uh, when he was talking about arguing with the Archdiocese about the Blessed Sacrament. Well, years ago, I helped set up a hostel for alcoholics in a suburb called Bankstown. This was in the 1980s. And uh, anyway, um, on at least two or three occasions, um, I organised a mass to be said there. Anyway, one day I got this phone call from the parish priest of... Um, Bankstown, it was absolutely irate. How dare I organise mass in his parish, you know, and and a home mass at that, um, without his permission, which he certainly wouldn't give. And um, so I thought, oh, all right. So then he said, and I'm so upset that I'm going to report you to Cardinal Clancy. And so my response was, Oh, very good. Um, you know, I I like Cardinal Clancy, and make sure you spell my name correctly when you talk when you report me. <laughs> well, I never heard another word, and uh, and we continued to have mass at uh, and this little hostel. Eventually, it was taken over by the Vincent de Paul Society, and they extended extended it and set up some other hostels too around the area. So anyway, so that's what it reminded me of about how, um, you know, church people get all hung up about rules and things and um, don't see uh, the wood for the trees or the pain of the suffering people. Thank God we've got brother uh, Pope Francis now, who shows a very different style. Anyway, that'll do. Good to hear you, Terry. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Terry. I used to go to a meeting out there in Bankstown Hospital a uh, long time ago. Oh, good day, everyone. I'm Stu, uh, alcoholic and a member of Calix. Um, okay, Stu. Stu. Nice uh, the bit I liked was um, they were talking about the mission, the Raphael mission or whatever it was, and then they discovered 
Calix and um, were able to unite with Calix. Um, and it just reminded me of, you know, we sort of talk about in RCIA that, um, you know, our faith is a, is the universal church and there's always a place for everyone. So that, um, yeah, everyone's sort of welcome and it's great that they were able to um, unite with, unite it together rather than sort of, you know, trying to forge a horde ahead on their own or anything like that. So, yeah, it just, um, I thought that was, a, 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 as Terry said, a great prelude to the story. Yeah, right. I agree, Stu. Like, um, for us to um, work together rather than uh, compete with each other. I mean, uh, I guess you've seen examples like that in your RCA in your own faith journey. Yeah, I think people are surprised that they, that that um, yeah, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. You go into a Catholic church, and it can be in another language. You can still you still know what's going on, you know, and you can still receive the grace and the prayers and and everything else. So yeah, yeah, it's the it's it's the mass that matters for us, eh? Mm. The mass that matters. <laughs> Uh, there's still plenty of time left. Um, yeah, I am um, I, Kevin and I, I am a child of God and uh, I know that. Oh, thanks, Calix, for introducing me to that Thank uh, you, identity. Thank you. And uh, obviously I'm an alcoholic as a member of AA, but uh, I've been introduced to that fact, which I didn't really, wasn't really conscious of. Many things I'm not conscious of. And I was thinking of, I was at the, the Easter celebrations on the weekend and I'm a person who likes to organise things, but there's an organiser, one of the acolytes is organising, and, and another acolyte organising. Okay, you're going to carry the cross. You're going to do. The, you're going to give communion to these sort of. The, you know, everyone's organising each other before the mass. You know, I'm thinking, oh, I was trying to just. Oh, that that stuff's all really necessary, but just trying to really get into a, a spiritual zone. You know, I'm just. I really want to be in the moment. I don't want to. You know, go through my life and I've missed it because I'm trying to organise everything. You know, and I think like being involved in like twelve step program and in particular introducing the Catholic faith into it, it sort of helps me to be present in that. And I'm so grateful that I found Calix. You know, for a long time, I, I um, what my story is that when I came into recovery, I did a like a like um. It was 32 years ago, right? I went to confession. I did, did a big, long confession. And about at the same time, I started getting with the local parish priest. Mum was praying a rosary. I started praying a rosary with mum. All problems for my whole family This in this sort of matter. And then at the same time, my elder brother, I knew he was going to AA, my late elder brother, and uh, he was about 10 years sober at the time, and he had a peacefulness about him. And I knew he didn't drink. And I knew he went to AA, so I got introduced to AA, started going to meetings, and all people in AA, like he said, he said, you know, be careful of religion. Be, you know, like people in AA, they say, that, you know, like, don't mix up the, the big book, you know, you know, the AA big book with the Bible, and, you know, you could end up with a drink, and you talk about one bloke with a drink in his hand and a Bible in the other hand, and so they really warned you and warn about talking about God in a specific, you never mention the word Jesus in an AA meeting. I, and, and I don't like that, you know, and I'm so glad that I found Calix. So it is totally appropriate because it is God as you understand him in, in recovery because it might not it might scare people away. It's not a place really to evangelize. So that's why in the back of this book it says about the author, it says that Calix um, proclaims the gospel to the membership of 12-step programs. That's what we do. We proclaim the gospel, maybe not by going out and saying in the meeting, certainly not by saying Jesus Christ is the answer, like, say, like a classical Protestant might, although that's not real, but it's just by, by doing being involved in the Calix Society. And uh, we've got these books here. I don't know if you've got one, Stuart, or not. I, I do have one, yeah. Yeah. I've got some more I got sent to me, so I've got spares. Um, anyway, Tim and I would like to meet with you sometime to wherever meeting you go to and maybe have a meal with you. We've got some other resources too, but uh, but I've, I've really enjoyed reading that tonight and about the founder too. What a humble guy. I never even knew about him. And the best the best kept secret in the Catholic Church. Well, you know, it's like a bit like saying people say, I, you could work next to someone at work 
you know, but sit next to someone at work for 20 years and not even know they're a Catholic because that's really how we are Catholics. We don't, we keep it to ourselves, especially in Australia. And Terry mentioned the America, the difference between Australians. They're more extroverted than what we are just as a nature, nation in general. And Tim mentioned about the dem, different demographics of people that AA you know, just, alcohol addiction just cuts across all different kinds of people. Mm. Um, but yeah. Um, did you get anything else out of that, Paul? I note that you had a you related to something there, <laughs> which I, I related to it all too. Uh, it's that part where he um, mentions about Bill W. going from New York to Philadelphia to meet up with the founder. That was very very interesting. I've I've never heard that before. So there was that connection. And it's not as if um, they had nothing to do with each other. They were very well acquainted with how things worked. So that, I found that very, very interesting. There's a lot of connections. This is the fourth time I'm reading this book, right? And I never even thought about that Eucharist, the year of the Eucharist before. It's only, I just thought about it just now. Like you can read things over and something else comes out. Mm -hmm. um, and that thing also about the connection, you talk about the connection between the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the church. There's also the connection there, but there was a total abstinence society there, which is similar like the Pioneer Association, which Brother Martin, our first chaplain, was a member of. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of interesting parallels there. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, AA is not a temperance society. Uh, it's a fellowship, but yeah. But, uh, anyway, um, any final comments before we uh, do some closing prayers? It's been a good meeting for me. We and uh, not um, uh, we'll be doing chapter one next week. We'll go through this whole book. Uh, normally, uh, we have other members here. Um, this is a good number anyway. Um, just again, I'll stop recording now. Uh, we'll stop recording. Yep, stop that. And.